Christmas, you wonder, why is Christmas really such a big deal? You ever really thought about that for just a moment? I mean, have you really thought about it if Christmas is such a big deal? Why do we make such a big deal out of Christmas? The very simple question that maybe you've asked before, but I think sometimes we fall victim to just answering the question really easy, but do we really think about the answer to this question right here? And it's this question. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? What did he come for? To save us. But I wonder how many of us really understand the depths of which he came and what he came to ultimately save and rescue us from. Take a question for just a moment. You think about, why did Jesus come to us the way that he did? Why, what's the end game? What, what was his ultimate purpose? Why did the God of the universe choose to respond to us to the birth of a child? Why is he called the savior of the world? Why does God call him that? Why does the Bible call him that? Why does humanity stop and call him the savior of the world? See, I believe for all of us today, the answers to these questions are why we're here today. Listen, I don't know what brought you here. I don't know what caused you to tune in online today. I don't know what some of you believe about God and Jesus. But I want you to know that I'm glad you're here today. Because I think the answer to these questions today are so vitally important to our life. I'm excited that you've chosen to be with us because I believe just perhaps in this moment that God has something he wants to reveal to you, something he wants to show you today. And my prayer is that in our time together today that hopefully, prayerfully, questions maybe could be answered for you for the first time or maybe for you to see in maybe a way that maybe you haven't saw it before. Or maybe this be a moment for God to remind you of why Jesus ultimately came for every one of us. See, I don't know your story, but I know my story. And I spent a great deal of my life trying to find something. Searching this world, trying to find something, anything, someone that could feel the longing that I had for joy and contentment and peace and purpose and, and hope. And it took me a very long time to realize there was something in my soul that was broken. You ever been there before? There was an aching in my soul longing for more from this life. There was something in me that was broken that this life couldn't fix. Again, I kept looking to people to fix my problems. I kept looking to the world to fix my problems. I kept longing for something more, expecting something more. I had this ache that was deep within my soul. You ever had that ache before? It's almost like this nagging pain that constantly reminds you that, that there's something missing within your life. You ever been there? You have all these things, you have all this stuff, but there's something in you that just nags at you that's constantly telling you there's something missing, something broken, that life demands more. And you find yourself almost anxious as you get more desperate trying to find something, some solution. You get anxious over just that feeling you have inside, a feeling like you can't grab a hold of anything that quite solves the problem, that fixes the ache within. See, I think anxiety builds when we can't find what we're looking for, and it leads our lives to becoming nothing more than just an anxious mess. We've talked a lot about anxiety over the last few weeks here at Hope Church. We have a culture that's plagued with anxiety, and I think the reason why our culture is plagued with anxiety is because we're looking to this world to offer us what it cannot. And we're anxious because we're coming back and we're expecting the job and the career and the relationships and the kids and the education and, and the relationship, well, fill in the blank, to do it for us and it never quite satisfies our souls. So maybe you can relate today. Without knowing it, maybe you're searching this world like I was, hoping that something out there can finally fix you. Answer your questions. Something out there can heal the aching within. Perhaps you're desperate for real hope, real joy, real peace. Maybe you're desperate for healing today like I was. I believe, again, in this life, we become more and more anxious when we begin to realize that the relationships and the marriage and the house and the kids and the education and the career and the friends and the status and the parties and the money and the sex don't do it for us. How many of us know this to be true? We can look back into our life and we can see almost the desperation for the next thing and the next thing and the next person and the next hookup and the next night and the next numbing and the next whatever it is. 
to hopefully do something to settle our souls, and yet nothing quite does it for us. When we have all those things and we still find ourselves scrolling at night, searching for something to fill us, we have all this stuff that the world says equals life, and yet we still feel so empty and purposeless. Our souls ache for more, and it's almost as if deep down inside, we know that the more of whatever we're searching for isn't going to do it for us. And yet we keep coming back to the same place, expecting for it to provide for us what it cannot provide for us. And I think there are some of us today who are tired of searching. We're tired of our souls not being at rest. We're tired of the aching that's deep within. And some of us today are desperate for something more. Now, again, I don't know your story. I grew up a church kid. Anybody else grow up in church? I grew up uh, not just a church kid, but I grew up a pastor's kid. You ever heard of PKs before? Now, you know what they say about a PK, right? I was every bit of a pastor's kid. Y'all pray for my four kids as I got four pastor's kids as well. As I grew up in an environment where I knew all about God and Jesus, I knew who he was. I, I knew what he offered. I knew the stories. I knew Easter and Christmas I knew the Bible stories. I grew up in vacation Bible school. I went to Christian school. I went to church. I went with my grandparents and my parents. We were at church every time the doors were open. But you know what? I had within me this misconstrued idea about God and Jesus. I started to believe somewhere along the journey because of religion, because of denomination, because of the judgment of people, because of the standards of religion, I started to believe that because of all the things that I had done and all the things that I exposed my soul to, that Jesus didn't want very much to do with someone like me. You ever been there before? So there's this idea that that Jesus came for the whole world, but he didn't really come for someone like me. And so it's so easy for us to fall in love sometimes with the story of Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus came for this whole big world and what she did, but we lose sight of the whole world and forget that he came for you. For you. And we disassociate ourselves with that because we start to believe this lie that he could never come for someone like us. And so I don't know about you, but I had tried to control my life and my destiny for so long. I had tried to find joy and happiness and hope and fulfillment in the world. But somewhere in my past, I had tried to control my life and my outcome and my eternity and my future. But I realized somewhere in the past, I had actually lost control of all of it. What I really began to discover is that I was never really in much control of it to begin with. See, anxiety is a result of us trying to control that which we are not in control of. You hear me? Anxiety is the result of you and I trying to control what we are not in control of. Many of us have anxiety today because we are trying to control outcomes. We are trying to control our life. We are trying to control our happiness and our peace and our joy and our contentment and our hope. But we don't have much control over those things. We're trying to hold all of it in the palm of our hands. Maybe you're anxious today like I am because you know you're not in control. Again, trying to control your peace and purpose. You're trying to control your mess. When our lives become a mess and it doesn't provide us what we're searching for, we often try to save ourselves, don't we? We continue the cycle of trying to rescue ourselves from the pain of the world. And so what are we trained to do in our world when it gets anxious, when it all gets to be a little too much? We start to self-medicate, don't we? We start to try to numb ourselves. We try escapism. That's what our culture is really known for. We're constantly looking for an escape route to try to find some peace or purpose or value or meaning and worth and a destination or another purchase. And so we scroll and we search and we long for more, desperate for more. And anxiety builds more and more as we become more desperate for this world to offer us a solution. I told you my prayer today is to hopefully answer some questions for you. My prayer today is to bring you some good news today of hope and peace and purpose to your life. My prayer today is to help you find a savior and for you to discover that you are not your own personal savior. That's what we all needed the most and that's what we all need the most. We need to be rescued. Our souls were intended to be whole and that's only made possible through Jesus Christ. This world cannot and will not fix us no matter how much that we hope that it will. So what if God ultimately knew all of this? And what if God gifted Jesus to us because he knew it was exactly what you and I needed 
the most. So just for a moment, why don't you think about this? What if the reason that Jesus came was to save you? Why don't you think about your neighbor for just a moment or your kid or your spouse or your friend or someone at work or whatever it might be. I want you to think about yourself for just a moment. What if the very fact that Jesus came was to save you, to rescue you? Because you could not rescue yourself. The most dangerous place we can get so often, especially in the South, as we grew up church people, many of us went to church. And we start just believing because we went to church that we're saved and rescued. But how many of us have ever really accepted the rescue mission of Jesus Christ? How many of us have ever really gotten to a point where we saw ourselves for who we are and we saw him for who he is and we become desperate for him, in need of him? See, I think sometimes our lives are just a little too comfortable for us to be desperate and in need of Jesus Christ. What if he's the savior that your soul's been searching for? What if Jesus came to save you from your aimless searching and scrolling and shopping? He came to save you from you trying to figure it all out. What if Jesus came to save you from the anxiety of realizing that you will never be good enough on your own to be in a relationship with God? And all the running from him isn't getting you anywhere. Can we be honest, so many times we get really anxious when we come to places like this or maybe we tune in online and we watch services like this because within our souls we realize that we haven't met God's standard. What's God's standard? It's perfection. No one has to tell us that we've missed the mark. You know why? Because shame and guilt and anxiety and fear and stress are all side effects and symptoms that remind us constantly and plague us and tell us that we are sinners and we haven't measured up to God's standard. So we often spend our time trying to run from God because God could never love someone like us, let alone ever use someone like us in a significant way. Or maybe at some point in your life, you started going to a place like this, started going to church, because after all, just showing up to church will fix all of our problems, won't it? And maybe you began to use your energy to try to earn God's love and acceptance. And you thought, if I just get to church and I can just show up every single week and I can occupy a seat and do everything they tell me to do, then maybe God will love someone like me. Maybe I can use all of my energy and passion and desire to earn God's grace. Use your strength that you do not possess to earn a love that you could never deserve. See, I believe we often believe the lie that life is hopeless. There are so many people we know today and many of us who have thrown in the towel believing there couldn't be more for our lives. And the truth is, as long as we continue this cycle, then our life will continue the cycle of feeling hopeless and meaningless. But that sounds like bad news, right? That all sounds like hopelessness, doesn't it? And if Christmas was hopeless, then we'd just be wasting our time today, right? But I believe that Christmas is about hope. And I believe it's not just some idea of hope, but I think it's, it's the, the word hope wrapped up in a person. I believe because of Christmas, there is hope for our lives. Because I believe that the, the story of Christmas is not just good news, but it's the very best news. Look at what it says here in Luke chapter two, verse 10 through 11. Y'all help me out. It says, I bring you what I bring you I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. I want to bring you good news, the very best news that will bring joy and hope and purpose and meaning to all people, to all people. This is a message that's been sent by God to some angels to take to some shepherds out in the field. And I love the very fact that when the message of Jesus first shows up to this earth, it goes out to a group of dirty, stinky shepherds. His day in culture to be a shepherd was like the lowest profession you could have. It was a profession nobody else wanted. They were the outcast. They were sent away. They were dismissed from people. People didn't want to be around them. And yet the moment that Jesus is about to arrive on this earth, he makes sure that his message is first took to the outcast. I think that from the very beginning of time, God is trying to give you a message that you are never too far from God. No matter how the world sees you, no matter how you see yourself, God sees you as you are and he sent Jesus to you. 
say there's good news. Today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. The Savior of the world. He has come to you. He has come for you. And because Jesus has come, there's hope for your life. Why don't you turn to somebody right now and say there's hope. Turn to somebody right now and say there's hope. Come on, there's hope. There's hope for your life. There's hope for your life today because he's come for us. I want you to stand for just a moment. I want to pray for you today. And we want to really tell a story for you today. All today is telling you a story about Jesus coming for you, about the love he has for you, about a God who wants to meet you right where you are today and love you in your current state, in your current condition. But he loves you too much to leave you as you are today. Let's pray together. God, today we are so thankful that in this moment, God, we are overwhelmed by your grace and your love and mercy. God, we are so thankful that you chose in this crazy way to invade this earth on a rescue mission because what we needed the most was a savior. God, we worship you today because you have come to us. Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord, the savior of the world has come for us today to meet us where we are. We love you today. We are thankful today. God, we worship you today for your plan and purpose. In Christ's name.
God sees you today that I don't know if you see yourself. You guys can have a seat for just a moment. I think the enemy wants you to believe the lie that God could never love someone like you. And many of us have bought into that lie. We believe the lie no matter how many songs we sing and no matter how many tears we shed and no matter how many services like this we attend or watch online. And we feel so distant from that message. I wonder how many of us, even in a moment like this, we feel kind of numb to this message. We've become so used to hearing it or so detached from it or we convince ourselves that that's not a love for someone like us. We hear all this stuff and yet we continue to just kind of distance ourselves because we think our, our mess is too much for God. Whenever you feel like your life is too messed up, I really do encourage you to pick up the Bible and read it. Because the Bible is full of messed up people. A bunch of jacked up, messed up individuals. I mean, some bad days when I have some really bad moments because we're all these kind of people. I read the Bible, I'm like, hey, at least I'm not as bad as he was. And yet God still used them. That's my story, that's your story. And God uses those stories to encourage us to show us his great love. There's a guy in scripture by the name of Paul. Paul's one of my favorite people in the Bible. He wrote majority of the New Testament. And Paul is a man by all means whose life's pretty jacked up. But Paul has a moment in his life when he believes like so many of us that he's got everything that he needs to have. Paul's a man who has amazing wealth. He has status and education. He has a platform in a community. He's part of a religious system. He's well-known. He's successful. He has everything that the world would tell him would bring success and purpose and peace to his life. But Paul has this amazing moment in Acts chapter 9. You can go read this story where he has a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. And for the first moment of his life, he really begins to see himself for who he is and just the Savior that Jesus is. My prayer all this week is that maybe for you, this could be that Paul moment in your life. Maybe for just a moment, time could stop and you could have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. And for just a moment, you would see yourself for who you are and you would see him for who he is. And that encounter would change your life forever. I believe it's possible today. I believe it's possible. If you have a Bible with you today, you can go ahead and jump into 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 12 through 17. And Paul's writing this letter to a young man named Timothy. And he starts the letter off by saying this. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointed me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Paul starts this letter to Timothy by, by thanking Jesus Christ for using and loving someone like him. Paul is blown away at the fact that in the middle of the mess of his sin that Jesus found him, rescued him, and is now using him for his purpose. He says, even though I was once, if you know Paul's story, Paul was a violent man. He was so religious that in his religion, he didn't believe that Jesus was the savior of the world. And so Paul spent a great deal of his life persecuting and killing anyone who claimed that Jesus was in fact the savior of the world. I mean, I want you to think about, this is how awful of a person Paul was. If you claimed Jesus and you told someone about Jesus, Paul set out to have you beat, imprisoned, or killed. This is how much he hated the name of Jesus. Paul said, I spent a great deal of my life trying to save myself. But I came to a point when I realized what I needed the most was a savior and a rescuer. If Paul needed a savior today, perhaps you and I do too. Paul said, hold on to this. Put your faith in this statement right here. That money and the economy and people and politics and relationship and this world will fail you. They will all fail you. There's only one constant, only one thing in this life, and that's Jesus Christ, who can give you the hope, the peace, the joy that you're truly looking for. So why did Jesus come? I wanna make sure today, before we leave our time together, that you have perfect clarity on why Jesus came. 
Why did Jesus come? The first thing we discover is that Jesus came to be your savior. He came to be your savior. Let me ask you a question. Who once was you? It's kind of bad grammar, isn't it? Paul said, I was once. What was you was once? <laughs> Let me put it in maybe some grammar that you can comprehend a little easier today. This question right here, who were you? When you sit down by yourself or you're driving in the car or you're in the shower and you're all alone, you're in bed at night and you're thinking about who you were, who, who were you? Who, who's the first thing that you default to when you start to think about Jesus loving you saying, well, I used to be, I, I, I am. Maybe the next question is, who are you? Who does somebody say you are right now? Who defines you? Listen, what you were and even who you are or what you're done doesn't have to define you. God sent Jesus to you so that you wouldn't have to do life alone. God sent Jesus to you just as you are. He wasn't called off guard by you. Jesus didn't show up in your life and was like, wow, you used to be that? Can't fix you. Can't rescue you. Can't save someone like you. He came so you could find rest in him, peace in him, hope in him. Jesus came to us to fulfill our greatest need. He came to be your savior. He came to give you life, the life made available through him and him alone. He came to restore you. He came to make you new. Verse 13, he says this, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, even though I was this awful person, he says, I was shown what? I was shown, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Ignorance and unbelief. I had an ignorance of believing that I was the God of my life. Unbelief of believing that I could do it on my own, save myself, figure out some way to work the rungs on the ladder to find whatever it is that I was looking for. He says, but the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world. Why did he leave heaven and come to this earth? Why did he wrap himself in flesh and invade this earth? He says this statement, to save sinners. Why did Jesus leave heaven and come to this earth to save sinners? He says, of whom I am the very worst. For that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of all sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. Then he goes into this moment of praise in verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. I told you Christmas is all about good news. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to save sinners. He said, I'm a sinner. He came for you. In fact, Jesus says, I didn't come for those who are, who are healthy. I came for those who are sick, who are broken. Paul wanted you to know, no matter how bad you think you are, he was worse than you. He wants you to understand that he held a title he was the chief of all sinners. That's a title that I thought I possessed for a really long time. And Paul said, I got the trump card on every single one of you. He says, and if God could love someone like me, guess what? He can love someone like you too, just as you are. Paul said God was patient with him. How many of us are thankful today that God is immensely patient with us? Come on, how many of us, that's our story today. I was a knucklehead. I, I used the word knucklehead the other day and my kids were like, what is a knucklehead? What's wrong with you? What era do you come from? How old are you? I was stupid. I believed the lie that I could find whatever it was that I was looking for in this life. I thought I could rescue myself through the system of this world. And yet God was patient with me in all my stupidity. He was even patient with me somehow even in the midst of my sin. And when I turned to him, he didn't come with an iron fist to remind me how worthless I was. He came to me with grace and mercy. He showed me his love, a love I didn't deserve. Even while I was running, even while you are running, God sent Christ Jesus to save you. Don't let who you are or who you were stand in the way of who Jesus is. You hear me right now? 
Don't let who you are or who you were or where you've been or what you've done or what was done to you stand in the way of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. Don't run from him. I'll say, you don't have to run today because Jesus ran out of heaven and ran to this earth for you. You can't outrun Jesus. As far as you think you could run, he ran further. And he's run to meet you today right where you are. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came as God's gift of grace, a gift we don't deserve, we can't earn, we can never repay, something we can never provide for ourselves. This gift came to us to give us real hope and real peace and real purpose and real salvation for this life and the life to come. Here's the truth today. If you are a sinner, then you don't need God's grace. Anybody here today say, you know what? I'm not a sinner. I'm perfect. We'll bow down and start worshiping you today. How about that? The very fact that you and I are sinners is why we need God's grace. And the gospel of Jesus reminds all of us that, that none of us, none of us are deserving. And yet God freely has given the gift of grace to us abundantly. Until today, you might not have realized that the grace of God is the only thing that your soul has been longing for. See, we don't understand God's gift of grace. We, th we say things like, Jesus can't use someone like me because I was blank. I have been blank. I was told I was blank. God could never love someone like me. I love when Paul says that I was the chief of all sinners, but he says these two words, but God. How many of us, our entire story can be summed up in those two words, I was this, I was that, I did all these things, all these things were done to me, but God showed me immense mercy, showed me immense grace, poured out his grace on me and his love for me, even when I didn't deserve it, but God today, that can be your story today. Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, but God. And his grace and mercy sent Jesus to you just as you are. Jesus came as God's gift of grace and love for every one of us. Finally today, why did Jesus come? Jesus came to fill the ache within your soul. Jesus came with a love that no one else could ever give you. Without knowing it, our souls are longing to be at rest, to stop the anxiety, to stop the searching. They're longing for a true love, a love a love that despite all of our mess, that loves and meets us right where we are. Our souls from the time we took our first breath on this earth are longing to be restored back to the maker, back to God. There is something built inside of all of us from the moment we took our first breath on this earth that is longing to be reconnected with the one who created our souls. We were created for something far greater than just the temporary things of this earth. You know what you're longing for the most? You are longing for an eternal love. Everything in this world is temporary. That's why it all has a time stamp on it. That's why it only gives us joy and happiness and contentment for just a few moments and then it fades away. We were created to be eternal beings. Our souls are longing. There's a hole in them longing for an eternal love. And Jesus came to give us that eternal love something far greater than the 60, 70, 80, 90, if we're lucky, 100 years on this earth, something to love us for all of eternity, something to restore us back to God, because I don't know if you realize this, but there is a life beyond this life. There is an eternity that you and I will spend in a real place called heaven with God, our creator and maker and sustainer of life, or in a place called hell. People say, how could a loving God send someone to hell tell people all the time, God's desire was for you and I to never spend a moment of our lives in hell. God went through the greatest lengths to rescue you and I so that we would never have to. You and I choose hell for ourselves when we reject the love and the grace that God has freely given to us. So God today wants to overwhelm you with his love and grace today. There's a love he wants to show you that this world cannot even begin to comprehend. I wanna pray for you today in just a few moments that we could reflect on a love like this that the world cannot offer us. A love that we can't even quite put into words today. As I pray for you, why don't you stand to your feet for just a moment?
God, in this moment, God, I pray that we would be overwhelmed by your love in this place, wherever we're watching this message from. It's a love that, God, we can't quite put into words. The fact that you would love us and meet us at our greatest point of need, that you would see the potential that lies in us, that you would show us grace and forgiveness, even though we've tried to take your seat, to be the God of our life, to do things our way, to do it on our own. There are many times we've chosen sin over you. We've chose to go our own path. We ran from you. And yet, God, you show us grace and mercy. God, we're all sinners. But God, you love us. We've all chose to go our own way, but God, you've shown us immense patience and grace and mercy. God, we thank you for a love like this today. Thank you for meeting us in this place. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
want you to know today there's nothing that you've done in this life that God through Jesus can't forgive you from. There's nothing that you've experienced in this life that God can't heal you from. And there's nothing that you broke or somebody else broke in you that God can't restore in you. Maybe you're exhausted from all the searching and scrolling and trying to find something in this life. Maybe you're tired and exhausted for trying to find something in this life that will finally do it for you. Maybe you're tired of all the running. You don't have to run anymore. You don't have to run anymore because Jesus, as we said, has run to you to meet you right where you are today. You might have some stuff in your life that's not right and you you haven't caught Jesus off guard. He loves you so much that he won't leave you in that state. He'll begin to heal you, fix you, forgive you, restore you, do things in your life you never thought possible. Maybe you come to the place in your life when anxiety is built because you realize you're not in control. Again, anxiety is a result of you and I realizing that we're not in control of very much. So when we get to that place, we've exhausted all that we have, why don't we choose to run to the one today who is in complete control? You and I don't have control of very much, but the one thing that we are in control of is that we always have the power to surrender, to let go. Some of us got everything wrapped up in our, in our hands. We're trying to hold it all together, fix it all, manipulate it, make it happen, keep the whole world moving. We don't have very much control over this. But the one thing I can control is I can let it go and I can give it to the one who can meet me right where I am. So maybe for you today, maybe for you, maybe in this moment, what you're feeling in your heart and spirit is the Holy Spirit beginning to pull you into the heart of God. Maybe there's something from the the moment you got onto this campus today or you tuned in a line that has been drawing you into the heart of God. That is the Spirit of God showing you, revealing to you His power, His love, His grace, His mercy. And some of you have fought that for a really long time. Maybe today for just a moment, God is calling you in. Don't run from Him any longer. He brought you here today for this moment to have an encounter with Him. He came to rescue and save you. Some of you know the Christmas story better than I do. And it's become a story to you. It's such a story that you're so numb to it. And maybe for just a moment, God's trying to to rattle your soul, to remind you of what he's done for you, to shake you up, to renew you, to shake the scales off of your eyes, to see him maybe again or for the first time for who he is. And he wants to remind us of who we are, not to shame us or guilt us, because if we don't remember who we are, then we'll never remember and see him for who he really is. So somewhere along our journey, especially in our spiritual lives, we start getting haughty, believing we're better than what we are. That's why Paul continues to remind us of where we came from and who we were. Not to put us in a ditch and tell us how worthless we are, but to remind us of the lengths in which God came to get to every one of us. So right now, in just a moment, the band's gonna sing another song and our prayer team is gonna come forward during the blue shirts. And during the commotion of worship and in a prayer, I think some of you today, God's calling you. He's calling you to stop running from him and to run to him. To run to the one who wants to heal the ache within your soul, who wants to give you an eternal love, who wants to meet you right where you are today. Maybe you're, you're, you're afraid to go pray with somebody to have someone pray with you. Maybe you came with somebody today and just say, hey, will you, will you go with me to pray with somebody? I just want to accept the love of God today, and maybe for the first time, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed by that. I, I want to lead you in a prayer, and, and, and as we're praying together today, maybe, maybe you want to slip out during this time of prayer, maybe you want to do that during worship. They're here for you. We're here to serve you today. We came for one reason today, that you would know who Jesus is and why he came for you, that you would know his love in a way that you never experienced it before. Why don't you just pray with me just a moment. God, today in this moment, God, wherever this message finds any of us today, God, I pray through all of the plans and all the weather and all the commotion that, God, your spirit right now would speak louder than anything else that's happening around us and in our minds and souls that you would put our spirit at rest right now and that you would speak very clearly and very audible to every single one of our hearts and lives right now. There are some that need you today. God, you brought them here for such a time as this, for this moment, a divine encounter to come face to face with you. For some of us today, it's a renewal. It's it's a rekindling, God, of understanding what you did for every single one of us. 
Maybe you're here today and you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus. There's no magical prayer. It's just a confession of your heart. In your own way, you can just cry out to him and say, God, today, I see you for who you are. And I see myself for who I am. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I couldn't rescue myself. And God, in your grace and mercy, you loved me so much that you sent your gift of grace and mercy through your son, Jesus. He came to save and rescue me from my sins. He came on a rescue mission. He invaded this earth. He was so serious about it, he went all the way to a cross where he poured out his grace and love and mercy for me on a cross. He shed his blood for me. He died for me. The punishment that I deserve for the sins I've committed in this life. He went into a tomb where he spent three days. In those three days, he defeated sin and the penalty of sin. He defeated our spiritual enemy. God, he defeated death once and for all as you resurrected him from the grave. And in faith today, I'm gonna receive the fact that sometimes my head doesn't let me believe the love that you've shown me, but I'm gonna receive in faith the fact that you do love me. And I'm gonna receive your gift of grace and mercy that was poured out for me. Today, I'm gonna put my faith and my trust in you. I'm gonna begin a relationship with you because I believe today that you came as a savior to save me. Maybe you're here today and you've already prayed a prayer like that before. But maybe God's breaking your heart today because you come, you become numb to what Jesus Christ has done for you. So I'll say, God, break my heart today to see your love, the love that you came to show me. Never let me get numb to that. Never let it become old news or an old story. Keep it fresh within me. God, in this moment right now, God, I pray that you would move in the hearts and lives of those that are here. God, I pray in this moment that, God, we would feel your love. God, thank you for your love. Thank you, God, for this message of hope and grace and mercy. May it change lives today. May we never be the same today. God, thank you today for who you are. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you gain something from this content, that it helps you to follow, to grow, and to live for Jesus. We drop new content just like this every Monday morning. So we want to invite you back. And the best way to do that is to follow, like, and subscribe on whatever platform you're watching to stay connected to everything we have going on here at Hope Church.